our first panelist is uh, Dr. Uh, Chris Mason, uh, who is a professor of physiology, biophysics, and genomics at the Weill Cornell uh, Medicine uh, Institute and director of the World Quant Initiative for Quantitative Prediction. And to me, that's really uh, perhaps the 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 uh, one of the greatest promises um, in technology is the personalized medicine. Um, and uh, return back to terrestrial applications. So I see that a virtuous circle there. How did you get engaged in this, um, in this whole topic of stem cells in space? You have the, the really cool project that uh, you and Dr. Brenda are gonna tell us about. Yeah, uh, well, some, we, uh, Dr. Brenda and I are both uh, uh, two of the 10 different PIs selected for the uh, NASA twin study, which I think a lot of people probably heard about, but it was, uh, really a unique opportunity to study identical twins before, during, and after spaceflight. Um, and Mark and Scott Kelly, who was, you know, uh, then both astronauts, now it's Senator Kelly. Uh, actually, Brenda, Mark just wrote back today, so we're getting more blood drawn. We should send you some for some follow-up assays. Uh, so we're still drawing blood uh, from both the astronauts for follow-up studies. And I want to do a, a few slides, because I think everyone's going to just chat for a few minutes, and then have, I think, more of a Q&A later. So I think I'll just go through a few slides about kind of the study and then also um, uh, some other work that we're doing that's going forward. This is, I'm gonna end on the next 500 years, but I'm gonna start first with something that's a little bit more uh, close to this time. And so in particular, uh, this is the study I was just alluding to is that's really integrative medicine with twin astronauts. And as I just alluded to now, one Senator. And one of the key things uh, that we, we had a, a variety of studies that have come out now at this point, dozens of studies, but one of the key questions we had is, do we see uh, the clonal hematopoiesis has come up already in multiple talks in the conference, of course, uh, is very relevant for cardiovascular and hematological malignancy risk. And one of the interesting things that we found is we were curious, just do we see any of it? Uh, in this case, this is for Scott Kelly, is do we see evidence of clonal hematopoiesis at all in the astronauts? And in this case, actually, we did. And in particular, we actually saw the allele frequency, uh, the VAF uh, for this TET2 mutation actually decreased uh, during flight and even afterward uh, went down. So for a little while, this is one of the rare examples where you know, there's been discussions about, say, vitamin C or other treatments or therapies to think about how could you decrease the, the VAF of, say, a mutated clone for CHIP. Uh, spaceflight is not normally on the list of ideas of ways to address CHIP, but now you can add it to the list of potential ways to uh, modify or attenuate the uh, presence of a mutated allele. But uh, it did, we've been following them since, and it did actually, you know, come back. So we could actually see when we published it a few years later, uh, this is actually for the space twin, we're calling it actually the TET2 mutation went down, but eventually actually it came back up again, and we're going to see where it is actually uh, in the coming month to see wh what's happening for this allele. But for uh, the ground uh, twin, you can see here that actually there, are, there are two different DNMT3A uh, mutations, as well as an LPL mutant mutation that was present, and those were relatively stable, but still fluctuating. And so what was interesting about this is we want to see, you know, in what cells do they appear? And uh, we could see that if we show it in, in CD4 and CD8 and CD19 cells, as well as in both blood, although the sorted cell populations, uh, they were a little harder to pick up. But in general, we could see it everywhere uh, across multiple cell populations. And we could also, then we then compared it to the Sloan Kettering database with Ross Levine of all the, you know, look at say external beam radiation therapy and see what is the normal change in VAF that we'd see, say for the cancer patients who are uh, uh, treated versus untreated in gray or if you're an astronaut. We only had, you know, had three alleles we were looking at for the astronauts, so it's a bit simple. But we could see it was actually within range uh, for other VAF changes we've seen. So that's my little vignette. I wanted to keep it to just a few minutes. And this paper we published um, uh, last year with a, a phalanx of other papers that all came out. There's a little bit of a surprise in this paper, which almost nobody knows about, but I'm happy to reveal it to you today, is that if you go to the graphical abstract, you know, we often make these for papers and you look in closely, you know, this is about the time when some of the you know, Mandalorian was coming out. So if you look closely at this cell, and you zoom in, you will see in the graphical abstract, this little baby Yoda that is hiding in this paper. We just did that because we just couldn't resist basically. In any case, um, that's one thing we've done. That's a quick vignette. The thing I'll close on is just say, uh, in the book that I just published this year, it's called The Next 500 Years. It's everything that I hope and think might happen for a variety of things dealing with cellular engineering, epigenetic and cellular technologies, uh, developmental biologies, for example, when did we find stem cells? The first time they were used in the clinic, when did we find ESC? So there's relevant for this group, kind of this fun timeline here of when did we find uh, stem cells and when can we actually get human really truly totipotent cells? And when could you imagine sort of therapeutic in vivo transdifferentiation, for example? I I'm hoping it'll be here. And then eventually I'm hoping by the time we get to the year 2500, we'll see all sorts of amazing technologies like autotrophic human cells or 
uh, you know, and, you know, beyond earth survival enhancement. So this is a, a book I just recently published that uh, looks at what hopefully happens in the next 500 years and eventually would go towards an exoplanet that we've discovered. And that's my vignette in just uh, about five minutes. And, Brilliant. Uh, Brilliant, Chris. Um, so you mentioned hematopoiesis um, and uh, the cardiovascular system are in the, either in the genome or in your best guess. Are there other systems or other key items that may be gravity exposure or microgravity ex uh, dependent that uh, where we want to look. Yeah, as opposed to say the radiation being the driving factor. Yeah, think? that's right. So what microgravity, gravity, gravity gradients, what, what do you have? A, do you have an intuition around that or any, any, any data for us? Yeah, this is actually one of the, the most common questions. I think I probably, uh, uh, Dr. Ron has gotten this question, I'm sure a lot too. Is it the microgravity or the radiation? What is the biggest driver yeah. for most of these phenotypes? I, I'm leaning more towards radiation because we can recapitulate some of the same expression changes from radiation. Uh, there are bed rest studies that also simulate some of these changes, but I think so far uh, I'm leaning more towards the radiation being a driver for a lot of the changes. And, and maybe even for some of the telomere lengthening, it might have just kicked off some of the cells that were about to die and actually almost did a cleansing uh, process. Uh, and there's there's even some evidence that you can activate the immune system with low dose radiation. Uh, there's several clinical trials at Cornell that are doing that. It's like low dose radiotherapy, and then you add in some immunotherapies, uh, which is uh, pretty exciting. Wow. Well, uh, so uh, clearly an example where uh, uh, development of uh, space science uh, leads us to terrestrial applications and. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, interestingly, the uh, the control though it, you you can still provide radiation exposures on the ground that are uh, analogous yep. to uh, uh, to what's what's out there on orbit. Um, so uh, let's carry on with uh, with Jana, and we'll get we'll we'll keep you yes. on on with uh, uh, Chris. So uh, Jana Stoudemire is a good friend. Um, and uh, uh, a great colleague uh, that we've been working on a variety of topics and is now the commercial innovation strategy lead for Axiom Space, who's helping to create the commercial space economy in low earth orbit for biomedical and technology research. So right on our topic, both um, uh, the science uh, of uh, be, uh, being in space, but also the technology uh, uh, effects of that. Now, tell us a little bit more about Axiom. And again, what I'm anxious about is these people that are now uh, uh, going uh, going to go to orbit um, through through your company um, and what their aspirations are um, for uh, for not only their experience of spaceflight but uh, for science and technology. Sure. Well, first, thanks very much for including me in the panel. Um, it's great to see you, Chris, and it's also, you know, fantastic to be a part of the discussion around what's happening with iScore with Brenda, and it's just such an exciting time, right, for science in general in the microgravity realm, and clearly the progress that the iScore team is making towards understanding what stem cells do on orbit and sort of what that means from a human health perspective is another piece that I think is really going to be exciting on your timeline of things to come in the future that we'll understand a little bit better. I wanted to just kind of briefly give a glimpse because I know everybody knows about the International Space Station that is up there where the twin study was actually performed. Um, but beyond the useful life of the ISS, which is probably somewhere at the end of this decade, depends on sort of who you talk to and when, you know, the, the concept of when it may actually be transitioned. But Axiom in 2020 actually was awarded a docking ring and will be putting up new modules for a commercial space station that will actually maintain our presence in low Earth orbit. So the first module that goes up in 2024 actually will be for habitation and for research work that can be done. Um, about eight months after that, a second module will go up that will increase our ability to sustain crew. So about eight people on orbit with some additional research capacity. And then the final module that will go up for research and manufacturing will actually re really be a dedicated research and manufacturing module for things like tech advanced materials on the technology side, potentially biomedical products as well. We see a lot in addition to the radiation effects, the microgravity effects of you know, no sedimentation, 
no buoyancy, um, convection driven buoyancy, things that allow you to do things like layer perfectly or have cells actually be in an environment where they signal to one another a little bit differently. Um, so we're exploring all of those possibilities. And by 2028, we're expecting that we will be separated from the ISS. Initially, while we're docked, we'll be sharing power and thermal control. And then the last piece that we will bring up is our own power and thermal tower. And yes, to your point, Eric, about the upcoming private astronaut missions. So clearly in the news, there's been a lot of discussion about people flying to space lately. Um, and I know you have a flight coming up on Sunday, which is just fantastic to see, you know, disabled ambassadors going to space as well as some of the more famous spaces that we've been seeing recently. Um, we do have a, our first private astronaut mission scheduled in February of this year. We'll have another one at the end of the year with Commander Peggy Whitson, who I think everyone is very familiar with from the NASA side. But, you know, our missions, it's a little bit different than what you've been seeing in the news. These are 10-day missions. So these the crew will actually dock to the ISS and spend 10 days while they're there. And it's very interesting because most of our private astronauts also are interested, very interested in collecting human health data doing research while they're on station, but collecting human health data as well. And, you know, they do already have some connections to Mayo and Cleveland Clinic um, for research that has been requested of them. And through the Ramon Foundation, Eton Stibe, who is actually going to be flying with us from Israel, um, certainly lots of health data that we're going to be looking at. But as we think about this new set of data that we can add even to what we have for things like the twin study and the NASA repository of samples, we really have an opportunity to actually even collect samples in a different way and look at the ability that we have to um, create new data sets that will be helpful both for human health here on earth and also for transitioning you know, long duration space flight. Do they have any specific experiments uh, teed up um, from the uh, uh, for these first few missions with Axiom that are uh, relevant on the biology? What can you tell us? Yeah, well, so uh, to date, you know, it's been interesting because there's a lot of wearable sensors, there's a lot of collecting of body measurement, kind of, but there will be blood, urine, saliva samples that will also be collected and we're working through right now, you know, obviously I know the inspiration for mission and Chris was part of the sample collection there. You know, certainly we wanna collaborate across all groups who are gonna be flying. The data set obviously will be much more robust the bigger that it can be. And we, as we standardize protocols, even for our upcoming future missions, I think it will be really good to continue that dialogue and work together. So we make sure that not only is the data set coordinated, but it, we can also somehow correlate it back to the data that's been collected over the last 20 years. Beyond being the pin cushions, are the, uh, the astronauts, uh, the Axiom astronauts going to carry out any uh, actual experiments themselves. I know Dr. Jameson and, and I are very anxious uh, to be able to uh, expand the laboratory biology on board stage. Um, so are, are they going to be doing any uh, uh, biology or other kinds of experiments while they're up there? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, we have um, an experiment that will be going up from the Sanford team on our AX1 missions. So we're super excited about that. Um, and we will be having, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about the research that they're going to be doing as we get closer into the mission. Um, much of it has been directed by the Mayo Clinic, but, you know, we're really thrilled to have the opportunity to support this team on the first flight, the first private astronaut flight and future flights as well. Well, let's turn to uh, Dr. Brenda Rana, who is a professor in the UCSD Department of Psychiatry and the director of the Biobehavioral Shared Resource at the UCSD Moore's Cancer Center. Dr. Rana, it's so great to have you and I like your emphasis. I'm a systems kind of person. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit more about the, the work that you uh, were able to do on the, on the uh, NASA twin study and the systems implications of being uh, in weightlessness. I worked uh, alongside with Chris Mason on the NASA twin study. And um, we had an integrated study where we were looking at the physiology of the astronauts. Um, cardiovascular physiology and um, 
what happens when they go up in space for for one for uh, longer than six months. So um, I'm going to share my slides and um, kind of tell you maybe the not so glamorous side of being up in space. As humans, we've evolved to live in one G of gravity. So uh, gravity's pulling on all our fluids downward towards our feet. As we go up in space where we lose gravity, all the fluids start going upwards. And this is this happens um, almost immediately when you, when you get into uh, the microgravity environment. So how does this feel? So well, think about when you were a kid and you hung upside down on monkey bars and all that fluid pressure going to the head. Now imagine that for six months or a year or th three years on the mission to Mars. So this fluid distribution is responsible for a lot of these physiological manifestations that astronauts feel when they're up um, in, in space for a long time. So one of the things that happens is um, they get a syndrome called chicken legs and puffy face. So with all the fluid going up headward, and if you, if you look at photographs of astronauts on the space station, they all have kind of puffy face and that's not some sort of you know, camera issue up in space. They're actually getting edema up there. And then they start uh, losing a kind of muscle and, um, and weight up um, in, in their legs. So that's why they're called chicken legs. So this can cause a lot of issues such as um, intracranial pressure. But one of the biggest issues facing astronauts who are going up for longer than six months is um, issues with the eye. So there's, a, there's several different uh, issues that um, astronauts are coming down with. Um, uh, you can see a global flattening, they get edema, swelling in the optic disc, um, and uh, choroid folds in the vascular structure of the eye. So the choroid is yeah, uh, basically the vasculature of the eye. And they get these folds, which look like this post-flight. That in some other issues such as cotton spots in the eye. This issue with the choroid folds is only seen in astronauts. It's not something that they see um, as a terrestrial issue. But um, of course, cotton uh, spots have been seen in terrestrial issues. So collectively, all these issues are known as the sp spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome or SANS. So NASA, you know, before they send anybody out there to Mars, they really need to figure out countermeasures for these issues. Now, unlike this issue of fluid redistribution due to microgravity and, and some of the other um, things that you see, like a drop in plasma, red blood cells, blood volume, when you go up in space, all astronauts see this. Not all astronauts come back with the same physiological manifestations in the eye and, and, um, and, and the pressure in the head. So we're trying to figure out what, what is the background of the astronaut or the environment that causes this. So currently about 60% of the astronauts are coming back from six months missions with, with these ocular issues. So uh, two of our colleagues on the NASA twin study, Sarah Svort and Scott Smith, also PIs, one of the 10 groups that were working on the twin astronauts, they came out with this kind of multi-hit hypothesis of how ocular changes occur during and after space flight and some astronauts, but, but not. So they, they saw that it was a combination of, they hypothesized it's a combination of space environment, such as radiation, these fluid shifts, hypoxia CO2 levels, in the International Space Station. And um, as, as Chris mentioned that, is it microgravity? That, that's the biggest issue. Maybe currently in the International Space Station, it might be more microgravity. As we leave Earth's magnetosphere, it could possibly be more radiation issues. That combined with underlying conditions, um, uh, their physiology and their genetic background all contribute to oxidative stress, and potentially endothelial dysfunction. Now endothelial dysfunction might be leading to some fluid leakage, which um, then contributes to edema. 
And then all the issues we're seeing in the brain and the eye in some astronauts. So this is a big question. And um, as I've been listening to some of the talks, I've uh, heard some interesting talks, and including, I think, one of the first talks by, um, uh, I think, Shannon Derrick on um, uh, vascular stem cells in the eye and hypoxia. And I think there's a lot of applications of stem cells um, research um, to provide countermeasures for these issues. Some of the things we did in uh, the NASA twin study is uh, we did proteomics, metabolomics, and one of the things we found that was kind of interesting um, as far as remodeling of the vasculature was, this is kind of a busy slide here, but what we saw in the twin astronaut, Scott Kelly, who was up in space, was a, a significant increase in urine collagen during space flight, all, all types of collagen, which gave us some indication that perhaps there's some vascular remodeling occurring. And, um, you know, subsequently, uh, with more astronauts going up for the six months and one, one year missions, um, and more proteomics data is coming out. So we'll, we'll see what's going on with that. And um, just a little bit more on the twin study. Another issue is um, just akin to atherosclerosis on the ground. The astronauts also, some of the astronauts, you can see uh, um, arterial thickening. So this is a um, this is data on the, the carotid intima and media thickness of the astronauts. Uh, ground twin, which is the, our, our Mark Kelly, who stayed on the ground. And, and the blue is, is our astronaut who went up in space. And you can see um, a huge increase in their CIMT as uh, they're up in space. And even when they land, when he lands, uh, it remains pretty high. So of course, there's now more data um, and uh, to, to look at whether or not this is going to come down or this is going to be a issue with astronauts that they will forever have high CM, CIMT. So we're doing uh, different works uh, on, on whatever uh, samples we have left. And one of the things that we're interested in is looking at uh, characterizing extracellular vesicles um, from, from actually endothelial cells and, and seeing what's going on with uh, gene expression patterns and proteins um, when astronauts up, are up in flight. So, you know, as we get more astronauts up there and we can do more genomics work, we can answer some of these questions. But, but um, these kind of questions, I think, call for stem cell research because I think they can provide ideas for countermeasures for spaceflight related manifestations related to endothelial cell dysfunction during the three mission, two year mission to Mars and, and, and even further. Thanks very much. Um... Dr. Rana, so beyond the individual cells, you think uh, agglomerations of cells, and uh, again, I see Dr. Jameson here, and of course, our 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 favorite technology is organoids, which is is rather than just the individual stem cells, but the aggregated stem cells and their interaction. How might that uh, kind of technology be useful in the the questions that you're interested in, both in the retina and in the endothelium? Yeah, I mean, um, I think one of the biggest questions is uh, if this this uh, ocular issue is progressive as you're as they're going up in space. I mean, this is data from just six months and a year, but what happens after a year and a half? And as as and then further, um, perhaps uh, some uh, some applicable tissue regeneration to prevent maybe blindness in the astronauts would be a, would be a good countermeasure. Yes, I, I think there's a, a real gender diversity on uh, on this, which uh, argues for a diversity in our uh, on flight on, on orbit populations. Because my understanding is that there's a um, a uh, this is a more a more a propensity for SANS in males. Is that is that not true? Yeah, that's what the data was indicating. But you know, now with more female astronauts going up, we'll really yeah. see what the issue we'll is. Find out. Yeah. Well, so hey, 
Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Jameson. Thanks so much for including us uh, in your symposium. Uh, and Dr. Mason and uh, Jana Sotomayor and Dr. Rana, it's, it's a real privilege to see you. I hope we all get to meet in person and have this, uh, have this symposium in person the next time uh, out here in California so that uh, we can bring people uh, globally together. So the last little pitch is for my, uh, my mission this weekend. I'm taking uh, 14 on uh, 12 people with disabilities into weightlessness on the zero G flight. And our, our mission is called Mission Astro Access. Uh, our, our, our idea is to increase diversity with uh, people with uh, disabilities. So uh, check us out on Mission Astro Access. And thanks so much uh, for having us.